Hello and welcome everyone. I am your host Patrice and today we open our doors to our Matrix HTC expert panel who provide tips, advice and their expertise on how to ace, stay on track and maximise your HSC marks. With many students struggling with English, we know how it can make the subject feel boring and stressful. And you may even start to avoid the subject as you fall further behind, but it doesn't have to be that way. We're here to break down the New South Wales syllabus requirements and get you on track to start acing your HSE marks. In this episode of the Matrix HSE Expert Panels, we're going to talk about how you can ace your HSE marks for English Advanced and how to get the results you need for a band six. We'll be covering sample questions and band six responses and the secret tips and tricks on how to ace your HSE marks. Today, we'll be joined by Mr. Patrick Conliffe, content manager and English teacher, and he'll talk about how to maximize your HSE English advance marks. Finally, I'll be here to wrap things up and send you on your way. It's going to be a fun time, so grab a pen and a notebook and let's get learning. Hi there, welcome to our English webinar, The Secrets to Acing English Advanced. My name is Pat Condliffe and I've been teaching English here at Matrix since 2012. Over the past 10 years, I've seen the benefits of teaching students a systematic approach to studying English Advanced. There is a clear difference in the successes of students who follow a process from the start of year 12, or better still, the start of stage six, and those who do not. Many of you watching, I imagine, would hope to achieve band six for English Advanced. Some of you though might just be aiming to increase your marks. Perhaps that means guaranteeing yourself a band five rather than a band four. That's also an admirable goal. Any improvements require grit and perseverance. With that in mind, let's look at the strategies we teach Matrix students to achieve their gains. So what are we gonna look at in this presentation? At Matrix, we're big on process-driven learning. That is, not just teaching students information, but teaching them the processes that are gonna help them to continue to improve their learning outcomes consistently, both in high school and beyond. At a fundamental level, this means identifying your issues first. You need to identify an issue before you can develop a solution. So you need to ask yourself, what are the problems I feel I have with the study of English? What do your teachers say you struggle with? Then you want to follow a process that you know works. To fill these gaps, we break English learning down into two distinct parts. Understanding, the learning and analysis of texts and the modules they sit in, and writing, the practice of composition. For Year 12, this will include a variety of different writing modes. Critical, persuasive, discursive, rhetorical, creative, and reflective. After considering this process, we'll look at applying these ideas and consider some of the challenges of the HSC. But first, let's look at the common issues students have with English. Do any of these sound familiar? Do they sound like you? I memorize essays and I hope for the best. I don't like studying English and so I don't make time for it. I don't know how to study for English. English is vague and subjective. You never know what the markers want. Perhaps you struggle with English because nobody has ever really shown you the best and most practical methods for studying English. Many students have never had a teacher sit down and walk them through how to analyze a text or the best way to read a text. Similarly, many students haven't had someone walk them through how to brainstorm, plan, scaffold, and then write a response. Another common issue is that students often don't understand the expectations for the subject. I've had many students distraught because they're under the misapprehension that they need to have an original insight to a play by Shakespeare that's been around for over 400 years. That's not the case at all. A lot of students don't know where to start, and because of the overwhelming and self-directed nature of a lot of English study, this causes anxiety and makes it for students to begin in the first place. Other students have come to rely on pre-prepared responses. They memorize generic essays and hope they can adapt them to a question in an exam. Most students memorize essays out of a lack of confidence with the text. They don't know it well, so memorizing a response is a shortcut to trying to pass off as if you know things. This is an amazing display of brain power. I'm always amazed by students who memorize 3,000 plus word responses, but I'm also bemused because it's such a waste. The student would spend far less time in the long run learning their text and a variety of examples from it and most likely score much higher. 
At the end of the day, memorizing an essay won't answer the questions that you'll be confronted with during the HSC trial or HSC exams. Here are some recent examples of questions that have tripped up students who have memorized essays. The 2019 Module A question asked students, everything is being dismantled, reconstructed, recycled. To what end? For what purpose? To what extent is this statement true of the text you have studied in this module? In your response, make close reference to the pair of prescribed texts that you have studied in Module A. To secure a band six, students needed to demonstrate skillful engagement with the statement to discuss how composers are influenced by another's texts, concepts, and values. Many students tried to use a generic thematic essay for this response, drawing the following comment from the marking center. Students need to work on adapting knowledge to suit the question as opposed to reproducing a generic thematic style response. The mod B question from the same year for Henry IV part one illustrates how challenging a question can get. Comedy steps into the path of history and is crushed. To what extent does this view align with your understanding of King Henry IV part one? In your response, make close reference to your prescribed text. This question provides a provocative and challenging statement about genre. To do well in this question, students needed to focus on the concerns and conventions of Shakespearean drama, not just examining examples from the text. Both unprepared students and students with pre-prepared responses perform poorly on these questions. One of the above issues, or a combination of them, leads students to disengage with English. Or students just don't get the marks that they expect. And so because of this, they don't make the time for English. But unfortunately, English is a time intensive subject. You have to invest the time in it if you want to succeed. So why not just drop down to English standard? It's easier. So I'll have a higher chance of scoring a band six, right? Well, Firstly, in the HSC, your top 10 marks are taken towards your ATAR. This means that for all of you, English is compulsory and two units of English have to count towards your HSC marks and your ATAR. With that in mind, let's look at some stats that illustrate why English Advanced is the way to go. In 2020, 30,558 students undertook English Standard and 26,127 did English Advanced. That's only a difference of a few thousand. Yet, when we look at the positioning of students in performance bands, we see a significant difference. 1% of English Standard students scored a band 6 and 14% a band 5. That means only 16% scored a band 5 or higher. But in the harder subject, 14% scored a band six and a whopping 49% a band five. This means that 63% of English advanced students scored a band five or higher. Studious students are much more likely to score highly in advanced English compared to those in English standard. You would have needed to be in the top 305 students to score a band six for English in 2020 for English standard. So how do you succeed in English advance? Well, first you need to understand the fundamental idea that underlies your writing for English. You're expected to produce well-supported arguments about texts that demonstrate your understanding of the themes and ideas in those texts. This doesn't mean producing a new insight into a centuries old text, but instead more being a lawyer or debater, arguing a case about a subject. With that in mind, you're now in a position to follow a process for proven success. Matrix students learn a seven step process for acing English. We break this into two components, comprehension and writing. To comprehend the text, students need to read it three times. Each reading is to achieve a different aspect or level of understanding. Students read for first comprehension, then meaning, and finally analysis. Then students are ready to begin writing. First, they plan and scaffold. Then they write the first draft. Then they seek feedback and iterate the drafts based on that feedback, and then they produce a polished piece of work. So what do these steps look like? Let's work through them one by one. Comprehension comes from reading or viewing the text for the first time. You read to enjoy and experience the text. You meet the characters for the first time, get to grips with the form and structure of things, and get a broad sense of the themes and ideas in the text. Some do's and don'ts to keep in mind when reading the text for the first time. You want to read it to enjoy it. You want to highlight or mark up interesting sections. 
You want to pay attention to the themes and ideas, and you really want to get to know the plot and characters. But you don't want to get obsessed about finding techniques and examples, and don't get caught up taking lots of notes. You'll lose the flow of the text. And don't be afraid to mark up your book. The second step is reading for meaning. Yes, that does mean reading the text again in its entirety. This is where you break out the notepad and paper and begin making notes. You want to read with two questions in mind. One, what is the composer trying to represent? And two, how is the composer attempting to represent it? During the second reading, annotate as you go. It doesn't matter if this means your text gets heavily annotated. Highlight and underline key points as you read and write notes in the margins. The third step, or third reading, is where we read for the detail and start putting together detailed notes. We take our annotations from the second reading and return to those sections and passages of the text and reread and analyze them, thinking about the whole. You want to keep these notes in an accessible manner. Maybe that means tables or mind maps and visual notes, whichever works best for you. What information should you add to your notes? Well, you want to choose those examples that reflect key ideas about the text or its characters. Ideally, you want these examples to use higher order techniques too. Let's look at an example of how you might decide between two different techniques within the same quotation so that you can understand why higher order techniques carry more weight than the more superficial ones. In the tragedy of Richard III, in the second scene, Lady Anne and Richard, known as Gloucester, are engaged in a war of words, and Lady Anne declares, For thou hast made the happy earth thy hell, filled it with cursing cries and deep exclaims. Now clearly there is alliteration and consonance at work in this example in the H's of hast, happy, and hell, and the C's of cursing, cries, and exclaims. But alliteration isn't a higher order technique. It emphasizes ideas and adds to the musicality, rhythm, and lyricism of the couplet, yet doesn't have a big impact in terms of meaning. If we look closer, we can see that there's a juxtaposition of ideas in happy earth and hell. Now, if we think about it, this is a metaphor. According to Lady Anne, Richard, or Gloucester, has taken the happiness out of Anne's world, making it a living hell by murdering her husband in battle. This conveys much more information about Anne's state of mind and Richard's character than alliteration. The repetition of sounds isn't what conveys Anne's distress at Richard's very existence. It contributes to it, but that's all. If we were to compare them, then juxtaposition is a much more effective technique than alliteration. So too is a metaphor. Not just are they more effective, you'll find they're much more interesting to discuss. So now we know what we should include in your notes, let's talk about how to structure them. Maybe you prefer to tabulate your notes. Having everything in columns makes it accessible and easy to reference. For example, we encourage our students to break down their texts in terms of themes and character and lay things out in terms of technique and effect. In this table, you can see how we've arranged the information we've just discussed. But if that doesn't help you remember things, perhaps you might prefer to use visual aids, like colorful mind maps. Some students do both. They tabulate as they go through the first reading and then transcribe them into more visual aids as they revise. Studies have consistently shown that handwriting and drawing lead to better information retention and critical thinking around that information. If you want to help with your note taking, perhaps you'd be interested in our blog article and note taking kit download. So with this, we finished looking at the understanding aspect of the matrix method. We've got some notes together and we are in a position to start thinking about planning a written response. At Matrix, we push students to write systematically. Planning first, then drafting, seeking feedback, and redrafting before submitting a polished piece of work. Let's take a gander at what that looks like. When you are planning to write a response, you need to plan appropriately for the task you've been set. In stage six, you can face a variety of tasks. You may have to write a discursive essay, a type of exploratory and sometimes conversational response where you look at an idea from a variety of different perspectives. Persuasive essays, which are mod C responses where you write a persuasive piece of prose on a topic of your choosing or one set in a question. This can be a more personal type of critical essay where you bring a range of critical, persuasive and creative techniques to bear. Multimodal presentations are presentations where you incorporate several modes, reading, writing, presenting, etc. Often these take the form of a video essay or PowerPoint presentation. Viva voce tasks are types of academic interviews with a teacher or panel. 
And you'll have creative tasks where you may have the opportunity or specific direction to write poetry, short stories, epistolary texts like letters and diaries, or perhaps a portfolio of work. And last, of course, there's the conventional critical essay on a literary text that you're used to producing already. Knowing the requirements for a type of response must inform your approach to the task. For example, you're not going to be experimenting with your use of literary techniques or structure in a Module B critical essay. Whenever you get a new task, you'll get an assessment notification. It's important that you read through these carefully and clarify them with your teachers. These will provide a detailed description of the task, describe the skills being assess assessed, and provide a detailed marking guideline or criteria that will explain what will constitute a band 6 or band 5 response. You won't be able to adequately plan, let alone write a high scoring response without first picking apart the notification and marking criteria as it will tell you what to focus on and what to address. Before we move further, it's worth taking a moment to examine what a marking criteria can tell us about the distinction between a lower band response and a higher band response. For starters, the terms band 5 and band 6 are misnomers. We use them to describe high scoring pieces, but bands only come into a play after the HSC marks have been collated. We look at a marking criteria and we can see it only has five different grading levels. Let's compare the criteria for a 9 to 12 mark piece with that of a 17 to 20 mark piece. A 9 to 12 mark piece expresses some understanding of ideas about human experiences represented in text, presents a response with some analysis of textual references from the prescribed text, and writes an adequate response using language appropriate to audience purpose and context. The key words we see here are some understanding, suggesting this response is understanding is only cursory and not fully developed, some analysis, meaning that the analysis in the response is sparse and not fully developed or reasoned, adequate response, it's enough to pass, perhaps a little better, but could be much more effectively articulated and structured. In contrast, NISA defines a top band response as expressing deep understanding of complex ideas about human experiences represented in text, presents a skillful response with detailed analysis of well-chosen textual references from the prescribed text, writes a coherent and sustained response using language appropriate to audience, purpose, and context. Here, the contrasting terms are deep understanding of complex ideas. The ideas in the response are fully developed and explore something insightful about what it means to be human. Presents a skillful response. The response is skillfully structured and sustained and contains detailed analysis of well-chosen textual references. Not only is the analysis detailed and therefore insightful, the examples chosen have been carefully selected to respond to the question, not pre-prepared writes a coherent and sustained response. The response has a singular focus, sustained throughout. Every argument develops towards a singular idea. The response is coherent in that it is clearly articulated and detailed. So what does this mean for you in practical terms? Most students, the ones who score in that 9 to 12 range, don't dig into the details and they don't have a sustained argument. More often than not, they don't have a thorough understanding of the text. Maybe they've read through it once. Perhaps they've used some online notes and assumed that would be enough to produce analysis and an essay. The problem is the questions for the HSC and increasingly the trial HSC at various schools are very specific. Generalized knowledge won't provide you with the tools to demonstrate a deep understanding of complex ideas or the confidence and knowledge to present detailed analysis of well-chosen textual references. The students that achieve those higher band marks are consistently organized, have read the text multiple times, have practiced doing unseen sections, and have written a myriad of practice essays. They know their texts. They know how to respond to a variety of questions. They have the confidence then to stay cool under pressure and produce consistent and cogent responses, even under exam conditions. Now, we know what the criteria define as constituting a 17 to 20 mark response, Let's look at how we'd get started with an assessment task. You need to be prepared for that, all of that the was tasks. To where we However, were for the sake of looking at this process, let us just focus on the critical essay, something that all English advanced high school students are familiar with. When it comes to writing an engaging and coherent essay, planning is everything. If you don't plan, you won't get a band six. You need to know what you want to write. This means knowing how to unpack a question. Let's look at a recent question so we can unpack the planning process. The 2020 HSC question for Mod A was, 
In textual conversations, the later text is often seen as a shadow, lacking the originality and power of the earlier. To what extent is this statement true of the two prescribed texts you have studied in Module A? This question requires you to compare a pair of texts where the more recent text is a reworking or adaptation of the original. The first thing we need to do is identify the keywords and the concepts. So textual conversations, later and earlier, all refer to the module studied. Textual conversations, which is of course a comparative study of two connected texts. Seen as introduces the concept of how people perceive a text and its value. This is subjective. Different students will have different feelings about the texts. Shadow suggests that the more recent text lacks depth, detail, or color, and is just a plain and hollow simulacrum of the original. Lacking originality implies that not only is the latter text plain, it is also purely imitative, der derivative, and doesn't contain new ideas. Power, in this context, refers to the emotional and intellectual impact of the text. Doesn't make you think. Is it one of those texts, books, or films that lingers with you? To what extent and true are asking if you agree or disagree, and by how much? This implies a nuanced response is expected. The markers won't expect you to go all in for one side or the other, as most things in life are not black and white. For example, while the recent text may introduce some new and contextually relevant ideas, it might not have a groundbreaking exploration of ideas central to our humanity. It's worth mentioning that if you are unsure of how to address a question, NISA has provided a list of keywords and definitions on their website. We also have an article on our blog that breaks down the expectations of these key terms asked in the HSC, and they're also used in internal questions for most school assessments. Once you've unpacked the question, you're ready to start considering the structure of your response. After all, different types of questions require different structures. A discursive essay for Module C will require a personal touch and a meandering structure as you first unpack your topic, then share different perspectives on it, and then summarize the different positions. A common module response for the HSC will require you to focus on a singular text for three body paragraphs as you dig into how the text reflects ideas about the human experience or storytelling, key foci for the module. A point of struggle that many students have with the common module questions is structuring their responses so that module concerns are front and center and then connected to the themes and ideas present in the text. This is something we dig into in depth in our term and holiday accelerated courses. A module B essay will be thematic in structure, but will need to be deeply targeted and very specific in how it approaches the set text. Students are encouraged to discuss the structural features of the text, its chronology, perspective, things like ambiguity. Often this makes an excellent framing for the first body paragraph of an essay before discussing how such factors shape the representation of themes within the text. This sort of sustained structure is looked on with high regard by markers. Module A responses, like this one, may take different forms as students grapple with a pair of texts, something students may need to do for an internal assessment for the common module, or perhaps you've already done before as a year 11 comparative study assessment. Students can opt for a divided response where they discuss the text in separate paragraphs. The first paragraph introduces the concept in one text before discussing how it is reflected in the second text in the following paragraph. This structure can be very good for presenting a clear, uncomplicated argument about a pair of texts. Or students can opt for an integrated response. In an integrated response, students will compare the ideas within or about these two texts within the same paragraph. This allows for direct comparison or contrast of an idea across texts. There are pros and cons to each type of scaffold, but it's important to note that you won't lose or gain marks for choosing one structure over the other. Your marks will be awarded on how effectively you utilize these structures to communicate your ideas. Once you've decided how to structure the response, you should brainstorm your approach and scaffold out what your response should contain. Next, you'll draft a thesis statement. Describe your argument and response to the question. So let's quickly examine what a thesis to the question we considered earlier would look like for Richard III and looking for Richard. Remember, the question was, in textual conversations, the later text is often seen as a shadow lacking the originality. The question was, in text, to what extent is this statement true of the two prescribed texts you have studied in module A? Our thesis needs to address the keywords shadow, lacking originality, and power. While more recent texts in a textual conversation lack the impact and gravity of the earlier text, they do tailor the concepts and concerns of the text to contextual issues in such a manner as to make them relevant for a contemporary audience. In Looking for Richard, 
Director and actor Al Pacino exists in the shadows of Shakespeare and King Richard as he attempts to make the tragedy of Richard III and its concerns relevant for a 90s American audience. This is a good thesis because it presents a nuanced argument. While there is truth to the statement, there are positive aspects to the more recent texts. It addresses the key words of the question and their synonyms. It begins by tackling the concepts in the question and then focuses on the relevance of this idea to the text studied. What you want to do then is quickly list up the three or four ideas that you wish to discuss. Then draft out your topic sentences for each paragraph. Finally, draft out a rough conclusion. Now you have got a blueprint for an essay. You don't need to stick rigidly to it, but it will give a clear structure for drafting a sustained response. This means that you've already produced the first draft of your key signposts, the thesis and topic sentences, for you to improve upon. This is an essential process for when you are in an exam, as it ensures that you've outlined and checked your argument before you write. This can save you from not answering the question, writing yourself into a corner, or getting exam stress in writer's block. Once you've this plan, you're in a position to start writing your first draft. So, some things that you want to remember when you're going through this process. Your first draft will likely be rough, potentially terrible. This is fine. That's the point of a first draft. First drafts are about you getting your ideas out. Don't write without producing a scaffold and plan. You won't secure a high mark without one. Your writing will be unfocused. Keep the text handy so you can check for evidence. You want to be able to refer to it as you go writing. And then, of course, you want to make sure that you stick to your plan. If you do a bit of digging, you can see how great writers like Vladimir Nabokov, J.G. Ballard, and Virginia Woolf all drafted and redrafted their work. You can think of first drafts like working with Play-Doh. You start off with bits of dough that you craft into the rough shape of what you want to achieve. You can then take this rough shape and refine it in greater detail over several different iterations, gradually making it better. The most important things then to remember about producing the first draft are that one, you start it, and two, you finish it. Always finish any first draft that you start. First drafts don't have to be good, but they do need to be done. They're the foundation for producing a refined response. Why is this? Well, once you have a first draft, you can get feedback. At the end of the day, your essay or any piece of writing for submission isn't for you. It's for your reader or marker. This is why it is important to see what others think about your piece. See what they say needs to be improved or removed. Remember, feedback isn't about you, it's about your work. Take it in the spirit it's given. It's there to help you develop something for others to read and understand. So, who should you get feedback from? Friends and peers and family can provide useful general feedback if they struggle to understand things or struggle to follow an argument. This is a sign that you've not produced a sustained or coherent argument. School teachers can advise you on their expectations for a task and whether you are meeting them or are on the right track. Matrix teachers and tutors can give you detailed guidance on structure and content for your responses. And you want to make sure that you get feedback on absolutely everything. That means getting feedback on structure and form, ideas, logic, your use of evidence, and of course, your grammar, syntax, and spelling. Once you have a variety of feedback, you can decide what you want to do with it. Weigh it up, consider how it's going to improve your piece, and think about what you can do to implement it. Obviously, not every suggestion is going to be viable or worth incorporating but you need to be willing to change anything. This includes getting rid of ideas that you really like or your favorite bits of phrasing or argumentation. Sometimes our favorite bits are the least accessible parts of the things that we produce. Drafting is, as I've said before, ultimately a process of iteration. You take a document, you critique it, then rework it to make it better for your readers. This is a process of increments and is time consuming. It's a process that you want to do across multiple sittings, if possible. The improvements you make to an essay you wrote an hour ago are going to be far less profound than the ones you make with fresh eyes a day or two later. For starters, you'll be less inclined to try and make arguments or analyses that don't work. When things are fresh, we do tend to get a little precious about them. I often get asked by students, how many drafts should I produce? 
And the answer is, as many as it takes to get a product you are happy with. This usually means at least three. The first draft is when you sketch out your ideas. The second draft is where you incorporate feedback and refine the shape and detail of your arguments. And a third, and hopefully final draft, where you refine the syntax, grammar, and spelling of the response. But sometimes a third draft isn't enough, and maybe it takes you one more revision to get it ready for submission. Some composers, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, Isaac Newton, with his fabulous hair there in that photograph, consistently revised their work between printings. They never settled on a final version in some of their works. So what should we do to produce good pieces of work? Reread your first draft a day or so after producing it. And when you do, read it for ideas. Check if they're correct. Read it for logical flow. Does the order of the argument make sense? Is there signposting? Do you signal what you're talking about in topic sentences? Do they connect to your thesis? Is the spelling and grammar correct? Do you have spelling errors or ungrammatical sentences or sentences that aren't sentences? Then mark up all the errors, mark up the sections where valid suggestions have come from your feedback, and write a second draft from scratch using the edited first draft as a guide. Don't cut and paste. In fact, writing first and second drafts by hand will help you write better essays and get you ready for long exams. Writing by hand increases memory retention too. Then you want to rinse and repeat this process for subsequent drafts. Ensure you follow a drafting process for writing responses. Now, I know what many of you will be thinking. I don't have time to do loads of drafts. And yes, you might be time poor, but guess what? So is everybody else. The difference between students who do well in English and those that don't lies in time management. At the end of the day, you need to have good time management skills and you need to familiarize yourself with the modules so you can be efficient with your time. So don't be time poor, be organized, make all your time count. Use a study schedule, plan your study schedule to cover the different aspects of producing work. To that end, you should aim for a minimum of two sessions a week where you're reading texts, two sessions for writing, and one session for drafting and redrafting. The more you iterate and refine your work, the more confident you'll be to nail your exams. So what now? What should you do moving forward with your study of English? Well, firstly, you want to apply this process. Remember, English has to count, so you need to work hard to get that sweet, sweet scaling nectar. Secondly, you want to familiarize yourself with the four modules you need to wrestle with. Let's give you a hand with that. For the common module, you'll need to be confident discussing human experiences, emotions, storytelling, and how the texts you study reflect the individual and collective experiences of these things. For module A, you'll need to know a pair of related texts. The latter texts, as we have seen, are mostly, but not all, adaptations of the earlier texts. Their contexts and how the shift between these contexts shapes the ideas in the latter texts. You need to discuss this. For module B, you'll need to know your text back to front and inside out. You'll need to form opinions about its content and ideas. You'll have to research what other people say about your text and consider whether you disagree or agree with them. For Module C, you'll need to read a variety of model texts from different genres of writing, fiction, nonfiction, speeches, and use these as the impetus for your own compositions. The idea is that you learn to write through imitation. You take bits you like from the model text and incorporate those ideas in your own pieces. You apprentice yourselves to great writers. During year 12, of course, you'll face four internal assessments and the HSC. One task will be a multimodal presentation. One task will be your HSC trial exams. The other two, well, they can take a variety of forms, such as creative or discursive writing or short responses. You should expect assessments with multiple parts as well. For example, a creative reimagining of a text you studied and a presentation about that set text, perhaps followed by a written reflection task where you discuss how you were inspired by the set text and how you attempted to imitate aspects of it. This is representative of a Module C question from Paper 2. Or you might be given a mock paper with short answers coupled with a creative task or an essay. So let's look at tackling the unseen section. With this in mind, the task that most often trips up students is the unseen section of paper one in the HSC trials and HSC. 
In this section, students need to bring to bear the analytical skills we discussed earlier, but under time pressure. Paper one usually consists of three or four unseen texts. There's usually a poem, a non-fiction text, and a fiction text. Sometimes there's a visual text, but not always. This is then followed by four to five questions totaling 20 marks. Questions are worth between three and seven marks. Students have 10 minutes to read the text. Sometimes this can total upwards of 2,000 words. They then have 45 minutes to respond to the questions. You'll be expected to produce the sort of detailed literary analysis that you engage with in the common module, presenting an argument, supporting it with examples, and explaining how these examples support the argument you've presented. Let's take a look at a recent question to illustrate this. The 2021 HSC paper had five unseen texts, a poem, two non-fiction texts, and two prose extracts. Each extract was about 350 words, with the exception of text five, which was about 1,000. All up, there are about 2,200 words, a substantial amount to read and analyze in 10 minutes. What we'll look at was the fifth question, which was worth six marks and set for text five. The text is a first-person prose reflection of the narrator's experience of their mother, an actress named Catherine O'Dell. It describes a scene where Odell is eating breakfast, a piece of toast. The question was, evaluate Anne Enright's use of narrative voice in shaping the character of Catherine O'Dell. The key words here are evaluate, meaning we need to make a judgment about things, use of narrative voice, the specific feature the response needs to focus on. This can include tone, register, and point of view, as well as techniques like free and direct discourse imagery and referred speech. Shaping the character, the way in which the above devices characterize the narrator's mother. Okay, so what would an average or mediocre response to this question look like? Although Enright shapes her narrator as the daughter of Catherine O'Dell, the audience is led to feel there isn't a good relationship between mother and daughter. The piece begins with a list of the characters her mother could play, a normal person eating toast and marmalade, a mother, an actress. The daughter makes it clear she doesn't really know how to tell her mother apart from a character she might play. The last line of the prose piece, not just on screen or on the stage, but at the breakfast table also, my mother Catherine O'Dell was a star, makes this clear. It contrasts with the opening of the piece and leads the reader to feel that there is a distant or awkward relationship between mother and child. The audience gets this sense of the inability to separate mother from star and star from mother as Catherine is described as my mother throughout the narrative. But the narrator only refers to herself as a girl of eight or nine and not her daughter. This response does some things well. It presents a clear thesis, it has a consistent use of evidence, and the student consistently unpacks the examples and answers the question. But the analysis is thin. It mostly makes superficial observations rather than developing something that is in-depth. The phrasing is stilted and not particularly developed. The student doesn't consistently synthesize the examples into their sentences and the response lacks structure. So let's consider what it would look like rewritten as a full six mark response. Although Enright shapes her narrator as a close and familiar connection to the character of Catherine O'Dell, the development of narrative voice throughout the piece leaves the audience with a feeling of disconnect between the actress mother and narrator daughter. The piece begins by listing all the people her mother could be. A normal person eating toast and marmalade, a mother, an actress. However, as the narrator continues, we find that she cannot distinguish between the different personas she witnesses within her mother. This becomes apparent through the use of metaphor in the last line of the extract, not just on the screen or on the stage, but at the breakfast table also. My mother, Catherine O'Dell, was a star. Especially when juxtaposed against the beginning of the piece in which the narrator did not use the word star to describe her mother. This accentuates the idea that even though she may have viewed her mother's personalities as separate entities, as she begins to describe her, she cannot find a way to disconnect her parents standing in the kitchen from the actress on the screen or stage. This inability to separate mother from star and star from mother indicates that Catherine's character is always acting and her identity as the narrator's mother is just another role that she has to play. This concept is further explored via the use of personal pronouns throughout the piece. While Catherine is described as my mother throughout the narrative, the narrator never refers to herself as a daughter, instead calling herself a girl of eight or nine. This suggests that the narrator has never been made to feel like a daughter, as Catherine merely sees her as a fellow actor, pretending at playing a role like in the movies. Catherine's inability to distinguish between fiction and real life becomes apparent in the last paragraph when she gets up and walks away. And the narrator comments that she believes somebody else will dispose of her unfinished toast and stubbed out cigarette like a crew, set crew member after the director is called Cup on a scene. Overall, we get the sense that Catherine O'Dell is more actress than mother and that her own daughter 
did not know her any better than the strangers on the street who claimed to have loved her. This response is clearly better, but why? Firstly, there is a clear structure. This is a miniature essay that has an introduction and signposting that will guide a reader through the text. The thesis outlines the argument clearly and the topic sentences connect to this. This response has more examples and the analysis of them is much more detailed. The chosen examples all respond to the concerns of the question and the analysis carefully develops a detailed argument about narrative voice and how this is able to convey important details about a relationship. We can see how this response improves on the first by considering the following two examples. The piece begins with a list of the characters her mother could play. A normal person eating marmalade, a mother, an actress. The daughter makes it clear she doesn't know how to tell her mother apart from a character she might play. In the second response, this is expanded to become, the piece begins with listing of all the people her mother could be. A normal person eating toast and marmalade, a mother, an actress. However, as the narrator continues, we find that she cannot distinguish between the different personas she witnesses within her mother. This becomes apparent through the use of metaphor in the last line of the extract, not just on screen or on the stage, but at the breakfast table also, my mother Catherine O'Dell was a star, especially when juxtaposed against the beginning of the piece in which the narrator did not use the word star to describe her mother. In this second sample response, the student has expanded on the original idea of listing by connecting it to a higher order technique, juxtaposition. This analysis takes in a structural consideration to produce a deeper and more insightful response to the question. So, where does your writing sit? Closer to the second example, or more like the first? If your writing is closer to the weaker response, then perhaps we can help you. Here at Matrix, we offer courses that cover all of the modules for Year 12. During Terms 1 to 3, we offer courses on the Common Module, Module A, and Module B. These are available both in person on campus and through Matrix Plus On Demand. These courses run over nine weeks and provide an in-depth exploration of the content for the modules. During the holidays, we offer accelerated versions of the course running for nine days rather than weeks. The holiday accelerated courses are intensive and cover the same content as the term. These are ideal for diligent and focused students who want to get ahead in the holidays. In the term two and three holidays, we run an HSC trial and HSC prep course. These are five to six day intensive prep courses to prepare year 12 students for their key exams. The textbooks produced for the courses are written by subject matter experts with significant experience teaching HSC students and helping them succeed. They contain detailed content on the modules and text set for study. All of these courses include regular assessment tasks and mock exams to help you prepare for the rigors and stresses of the HSC. Full course students can attend one-on-one -on -one workshops during the term to work on areas they struggle with, while the classroom tutorials provide excellent opportunities to receive detailed feedback on their work and discuss the challenging concepts in the modules and the texts. Matrix Plus On Demand students have access to Q&A boards where their questions will be answered in one working day, and they'll also receive detailed feedback on their homework submissions and submitted pieces. The secret to English success is not innate skill, and it's not magic. Instead, it's just plain old consistent work and following a process. Anyone can succeed in English Advanced with the right mindset and hard work. We've seen it here time and time again. Ultimately, you're in charge of how you perform in English. And that wraps everything up. I hope this presentation has provided you with some ideas about how to improve your English marks. It's been a pleasure sharing these strategies with you, and maybe I'll see you in my English classroom in the future. Bye for now. Thank you for joining us today from Matrix HSC Expert Webinar Panel. Today we have covered how to ace your HSC English for advance with tips and tricks from our Matrix HSC experts. Thank you to all of our incredible students and their friends for attending our Matrix HSC expert panels. We hope we've empowered you with the knowledge and tools you need to study effectively. We look forward to seeing you in the future at Matrix Advance and best of luck for your HSC.